today I want to talk to you about your infrastructure and to tell you that it's not as unique as you think it is. It's uh, actually probably not all that unique at all, even though you might think it is. So how many of you have uh, written software that is uh, not for your product at your company? Okay, a bunch of you. So we call that overhead in the business school, right? This is stuff that you do that doesn't contribute to the profits of your company. And the idea of, at most companies is to get rid of this. And so by the end of this talk, what I'd like to convince you of is that you only have an illusion of choice, that there really is only one right way to do everything, and it's my way. So at the end of this talk, you're going to agree with me, I promise you. But really, it's about asking the right questions, right? We have to ask the right questions to get the right answers. If we ask the right questions, then the choice is typically inevitable. One of the great ways to ask the right questions is incident reviews. Earlier you heard a great talk about uh, incident reviews and outages. And uh, so I come from a background where I used to, uh, I, I worked at one company where the purpose of the incident review was to figure out whose bonus was going to be docked. So of course nobody wanted to come to an incident review because if you didn't come, you couldn't get docked. So then they changed the policy and said if you didn't come, you were automatically at fault for the incident. So now we have this culture where people either show up and stay silent or don't show up at all and nobody wants to admit fault, which is a terrible way to do your incident reviews. So luckily at uh, Netflix, the last place I worked, uh, it's very different. Uh, the purpose of an incident review uh, was to find out what happened, right? And it's a lot like uh, you heard about Google's incident reviews. People are dying to come to the incident review to talk about what happened. An incident review is a great place to generate questions to generate the right questions. So when you're dealing with scalability, you have a lot of problems that show up in the system. And so you want to get to the bottom of those questions. Some other questions that you hear a lot, build or buy. Uh, I would contend that those aren't really two different choices at all. So you can build something and spend a bunch of engineering time writing this code, or you could buy something. And chances are what you want mostly exists already. You can buy something that gets you 90% of the way there. And then the question is, do you spend that in time integrating it and working around the small parts that don't exist? Or do you build something from scratch? And right now, in our uh, engineering culture, we like to build from scratch. You know, there's non-invented here syndrome, and we really like to get out there and get our hands dirty, because we're engineers and that's what we do. And what I'd like to try to instill in you today is this idea that maybe that's not always the best way to go about it. Because while it's fun to go and build your own thing, it's also great to use something that already exists where somebody else has already found all the edge cases, where somebody else who might be smarter than you has figured out the problems. Because I know that there's a lot of people out there who are smarter than me who are figuring these things out, and so I'd much rather let them do it and build off of their work. Another important question is this monolith or microservice. Uh, the timing for this is fortuitous because it turned out to be a very hot topic in the last week of, uh, or so of, you know, which is better, monolith or microservice. Uh, there's good arguments for both sides. Uh, my personal view, which is what the rest of this talk is about, is that microservices are the way to go. That's the only way you're going to build a reliable, scalable infrastructure. However, I, whenever I'm advising startups, I almost always tell them to not do microservices. I tell them to start with the monolith because microservices have a lot of problems, and overhead especially. This is what I de declare as a proper microservices architecture. It has a lot of different parts to it. It requires a lot of things to be right. And so the rest of this time, I want to tell you about my ideal microservices architecture and why you should do it that way. I'm going to start by pointing out that most mature companies have gone through this evolution. They started with the monolith, then they realized that they were having trouble with the reliability and scalability of that, and they started breaking services out and you know, putting small services here and there that were accessed by the monolith until they've gotten to the point of having an entire microservices architecture and a platform to go with it. And all of these companies have done the same thing. They went through and they built an internal platform for their microservices. But those platforms are just good enough. Because if you're building a platform, you're not contributing to your product. And so you're going to stop when it works well enough to do what you need to do. 
And that's my number one case against building it on your own, right? Is you're gonna stop when it's good enough. People who are building it for other purposes, maybe it's their product, they're gonna do it till it's great. So that's one big reason to not do it on your own. Another big reason is because what we found talking to a bunch of these people is that they're basically spending about 25% of their time on their microservices platform. So they're either having all of their engineers spend a quarter of their time worrying about, uh, you know, how are we going to utilize the cloud? How are we going to do our security? How are we going to do our service discovery? Or they have a dedicated team that represents about a quarter of all of their engineering worrying about these problems for the entire company. That second one at least is a little bit better, but again, you're spending essentially a fourth of your engineering time worrying about this microservices architecture. And they're all basically building the same thing. When you go and you talk to these folks, they're pretty much all building that diagram that I showed you earlier. And it's not all that different from one to the next to the next. So the question is, why are we doing this? You know? Well, because there's nothing out there to help with this. There's the Netflix open source platform, so Netflix tries to solve this problem by releasing a bunch of our platform open source, uh, but you know it's hard to use, and it is somewhat, uh, you, you kind of need to really understand it, because it's not built as a product for everyone else to use. It's a built as a product for Netflix to use. It happens to be available for everyone else to use. So if you're starting out today, if you come to me and you say, I'm starting my company today, I want to build right from the start, and I'm going to do microservices, then this is how I would tell you to go about doing that. Uh, first, I would say pick your cloud provider. So uh, I advise a bunch of startups, and if they tell me that they're going to go and get a data center, I tell them that I am not really interested in working with them anymore. Unless they have a really good reason to be buying hardware, I don't see any reason for uh, a company to start on hardware. They should really be starting in the cloud. Why? The cloud offers elasticity, so if they suddenly get really popular, they have that there to help with. There's a lot of underlying infrastructure already built for the cloud. There's a lot of understanding around the cloud. Also, it makes all of those magical promises about infinite scalability and global in seconds and all of this stuff. Whether that's true or not, at least the possibility is there to potentially take advantage of that. And then you have to build your microservices platform. And your platform has to include a bunch of stuff. You want to start with your continuous integration. So there's a bunch of tools out there that do continuous integration today. And sure, you could choose between any of those tools. But at the end of the day, what you're essentially doing is you're asking, can this tool run my tests automatically? Uh, can it produce usable objects? And does it allow for single click from uh, check-in to deployment? Those are the questions that I would be asking of my continuous deployment solution. Is, you know, can we get to the point where my develop, de developer checks in their code and it goes straight to the, uh, running in the cloud? And each of those tools can get you some of the way there and you'll have to do some integration. But at the end of the day, you're gonna need something that does, answers these questions for you. The next thing you're gonna need is a good monitoring system. Uh, so it's interesting that we had a talk about log files uh, especially about how they basically throw away most of their log files. And I agree with that 100%. If you're saving your log files, then you probably are just wasting a bunch of resources. Because almost never have I seen where somebody has a problem and they go digging into their collected archives of log files and actually find the problem. At best, what they find is a pointer to where to go look in the future. And what I like to say is, you know, if the problem exists now, it's going to keep existing in the future. So if you really need log files about a problem, just go get them when you need them. There's a problem happening. Let's save some log files right now until we find that problem and then stop saving them. Uh, at Netflix, we had this huge infrastructure that collected all of the log files from all of the tens of thousands of servers, put them all in one place, made them super searchable. It cost a whole bunch of money, and no one ever really used it. Because whenever there was a problem, they would just log into one of the machines and look at the logs that were scrolling by right on that one machine and find the problem and fix it. So my personal feeling is don't bother with the log files. And this was hard for me to accept personally when I started not looking at log files. Because when I worked at Reddit, I always had one screen open with the log files scrolling by. But you know what I did with those log files? 
The way I knew something was broken was when it started to scroll really fast. That's how I knew something was broken. And it's fun, and you laugh, but that's actually how Facebook did it too. They would just have their log files, and when it started to scroll really quickly, they knew something was wrong. Especially if it happened right after deployment. They would roll back. Then they would go look and figure out what happened. They have better monitoring now, and I use better monitoring too. So what I look for in my monitoring tools now is I look for things that are looking at clusters of uh, machines, especially if you're running this architecture of microservices, right? Then you've already got clusters that are homogeneous in theory, and so you should be looking at the clusters of machines. You should be raising your abstraction level. You shouldn't really be worrying about individual machines, especially if you're in the cloud, because that's Amazon's problem. If one machine is broken, then let Amazon deal with that, you know? Just delete it. If it keeps happening over and over and over again, then sure, let's, uh, you know, let's take a look and maybe it's the software. But generally, if one machine is an outlier, you just want to get rid of it. So really, you want uh, monitoring that has good outlier detection, right? You also want to be uh, looking at, uh, well, this is more of a tip than a question, but if you want to look at an increase of failure, not a lack of success. Why do you want to do this? Well, because in a good microservices architecture, you're going to be shifting traffic around as, as uh, problems arise, right? You're going to be moving traffic from something that might be broken to something that isn't, uh, or from one data center to another for testing purposes. And if all of your alerting is on lack of success, then you're going to end up with a bunch of false positives. And you're going to suddenly have all these alerts firing while you're doing some normal operation, and it's going to be completely distracting, and you're not even going to know if you were successful. But if you alert on the increase of failure, then in theory, when you move a bunch of traffic away, you won't see an increase in failure. So that's one really important thing about mo a good monitoring solution is that you can do that. And then another really important question to ask is this question of how many aspects can you slice and dice on, right? Some uh, monitoring solutions have a lot more capabilities than other as far as slicing and dicing. The more you can slice, the, better, the easier it is going to be to hone in on a problem. Because another thing you really want to do when you're doing good monitoring in a distributed architecture like this is you want to do application monitoring. And you want it to be self-service. You want to make sure that you, developers can put in the metrics that make sense for their service so that they can then monitor that service, set up alerts for that. And maybe some other people in the company can do that too. right? So if I care a lot about my downstream provider, I can get alerts on their system so I know that their system is breaking before I have to deal with it, for example. So self-service is really good. Application arbitrary metrics is really good. And then being able to slice on as many as possible. And it's really important to have actionable metrics. You don't just want a bunch of metrics coming in that aren't actionable, right? A whole bunch of metrics coming in that tell you nothing are not useful and, in fact, are harmful because they're going to be distracting, they're going to fill up your disks, and they're going to slow down your diagnosis of problems. So you want to make sure that your metrics are actionable. Uh, one thing that we did at Netflix is uh, every time an alert went out, it came with a little one-click survey at the top that said, was this alert useful? And you just click yes or no. And then everybody would get statistics around whether the alerts that they had were useful. So they could see this alert was 99% useful and this one was 20% useful. And so for the 20% useful one, they could stop sending that alert <clears throat> or figure out what 20% was useful and make a better alert so that they would have actionable, then that was an actionable metric in and of itself. This uh, on the screen here is an example of an actionable metric that we did at Reddit. So uh, what we wanted to do was uh, one of the common memes with Reddit is search sucks. So everyone would say search sucks, search sucks. So we just added that little button there at the top that said, was this search useful, yes or no? And we started having people send us that information. <clears throat> and it was about 70% would say yes. So that's already pretty good. You know, that's better than half the people, at least. Uh, then we went and changed the underlying search infrastructure. Uh, we completely replaced the search engine. We didn't tell anybody. We just changed the search engine. And suddenly, that number went up to 92%. Uh, so we knew that that was a good change. That was an actionable metric, because we knew that what we had done was a good thing. Then we went and blogged about it, and everyone said, oh, yeah, it's great now. It sucked before. And we were like, yeah, actually, we did that three months ago. And they're like, oh, yeah, I kind of noticed that it got better about three months ago. But uh, it's, that's a nice side story about uh, your users uh, will see what uh, you want them to see if you craft the message correctly. 
<laughs> the same thing happened when we moved to EC2. Uh, we announced that we moved to uh, EC2 about nine months after we did it, and all of a sudden, everyone was saying, oh, this, this, all this stuff is broken now. It's like, uh, no, it's not, because we did that nine months ago. So the next one is uh, network and traffic configuration management. Uh, this is a really important part of a good, scalable, uh, you know, distributed system. You need this ability to be able to manage your traffic. And there's two kind of different uh, aspects to this traffic management, right? There's the uh, automatic creation of your networks. So you want to have your uh, networks divided up. Uh, if you're using EC2, for example, uh, going forward, you must use VPC. Uh, VPC is super understandable if you're an experienced network engineer. Uh, if you're not, it's not that easy to use. So it's great if there's some tools that can help you, you know, manage those network configurations. <laughs> you also want to have uh, automatic movement of traffic. So this is really important, right? When you're having failures in the system, which you're going to have all the time, you want your system, your traffic system, to be moving the traffic away from those failures. Uh, so, you know, at Netflix, we're multi-region, uh, multi or, uh, yeah, multiple regions, U.S. East, West, Europe, and in, at least in the United States, in North America, if there's a problem in one of the regions, the traffic can be shifted over to the other region. Uh, it's not automatic yet, but it's getting there. And so that's the idea, is to get to a point where failure is automatically detected and traffic is just shifted around automatically. Uh, this already happens when there's failures in particular zones. I'll get to that a little bit more later. And then one other thing I really want to stress here is don't build your own load balancer. How many of you have tried to build your own load balancer before? Admit it. All right, a couple of hands are up. Uh, so <clears throat> don't do that. Uh, there's some good ones out there. Uh, HA Proxy is my favorite. Uh, the guy who writes it, super smart guy, knows what he's doing, M way better than most other people. Just use that. So another important part of this uh, is service discovery. Uh, when you're running these microservices architecture, you need to be able to find what you're running, right? When you have one service that says, I need an X, it, it needs to know where to go and get X. DNS sucks for this problem because DNS has caching, it's slow to update, uh, it's got lots of other little problems to it. And there's no great solutions around service discovery right now. This is a fairly new problem. Uh, some people will yell at you, me and say, wow, what about Zookeeper? Zookeeper is great but it's a single point of failure. It does have its own reliability story around it, but it's still basically a single point of failure. And uh, that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid these single points of failure. So <clears throat> I would say that you know, you gotta, there still needs to be a good solution to this. Uh, Netflix has a solution that's open source, and it's OK. Uh, and there's another version coming that's better, but there's still nothing great. And then there's a whole different aspect to service discovery, and that's more around data discovery, right? And where do you put your data? So most of us know about hashing and hashing algorithms uh, and hashing data structures, but there's a second layer to it. When you have this distributed architecture, you need to pick a good hashing algorithm that moves your data around from part to part of your infrastructure. So one of the biggest costs in a distributed infrastructure is moving data from place to place. In fact, that is gonna be your biggest cost. All of the other costs are basically neg negligible compared to moving your data from one machine to another. So you want to do it in an intelligent way and in a smart way. And you want it to be evenly distributed because you don't want hotspots. So what you see here is an example of a very naive hashing algorithm. It's mod, right? You take the number of servers you have and you mod by that number. The problem with mod, which incidentally is the default hashing algorithm for a lot of distributed libraries, is that when you add a server, everything moves around. So you've essentially just invalidated your entire cache. This is bad. You don't want to invalidate your entire cache because now your databases are going to be super overloaded getting a bunch of data back into the cache, warming them back up. There's some solutions to this. Uh, how many of you are familiar with consistent key hashing? I see uh, about half the hands up. That's awesome. That's more than I see most of the time. Consistent key hashing, essentially, if you imagine your key space as the unit circle, and each uh, server is responsible for everything on the circle to, you know, the, to the clockwise of it. So A is responsible for the first part, B for the next. The nice thing about this is when you add a server, essentially what you've only invalidated one small part of your cache. 
So uh, you know, it inverses the ratio, basically. So instead of invalidating almost all of your cache, you've invalidated almost none of your cache. This is a great algorithm. This is the default algorithm for uh, Cassandra, for example. And it generally works really well. It does have one little problem, though, in that if you suddenly lose a server, you get a hot spot because now you have one server that's essentially responsible for twice as much space as the rest. There's a solution to that, though, which is rendezvous hashing, or highest random weight. Uh, this has fairly only become popular fairly recently. That's the very complicated algorithm for it. But don't worry about that. Well, all you need to know is that essentially what happens is every node will calculate a number uh, based on the, IP, the uh, hash of the data and the IP address of all the different machines that it could go to. And it will come up with an answer. And it'll pick the highest number. And the nice thing about this is that basically every machine independently comes to the same solution. So you don't need any sort of protocol about ex telling every machine this machine is responsible for this hash, which is another problem with consistent key hashing is you have to somehow let everybody know who's responsible for what. This way you don't have to do that. And if you lose a node, because the algorithm is random, all of that data will move across the entire uh, infrastructure. So if one node is gone, then all of, those, all of that data will be spread around evenly, and so you'll still have a nice even distribution. So this is a great hashing algorithm for distributing your data across your servers, which is arguably more important than the way that you're distributing your data within your data structures. Another really important part of a good solid platform is testing. Everything you have is going to break at some point. We no longer live in a world where we have servers that have super redundancy and reliability because that actually doesn't ever work and it's expensive anyway. So instead we just use a bunch of commodity hardware that's gonna fail all the time. And that's okay. 20 years ago you would make fun of a sysadmin who was taking backups but never restoring them. Today, I will make fun of you if you are not doing testing. If you think that you are reliable, but you never actually try it out. So you must intentionally break your system all the time. Uh, and do it in production. Especially with a distributed system, it's really hard to replicate all of the edge cases in test. So it's even more important that you do your testing in production. And if you have a good, solid system, nobody will notice that you're doing this testing. So have you, uh, how many of you have heard of the Netflix Simian Army, the Chaos Monkey? Excellent, about three-fourths of the hands, it's great. So the idea behind the Simian Army is this idea of automated testing. It's uh, simulate things that'll go wrong and find things that are different. And the simulating things that go wrong is the part I really wanna talk about. So the Chaos Monkey is the most famous of the, of the monkeys. Chaos Monkey is, I think, about five years old at this point. Uh, and Chaos Monkey started out as a small Perl script that basically would just randomly ter terminate instances in Amazon in production throughout the day. And at first, people got really pissed off about this because their stuff would break all the time, right? They'd be like, oh crap, you just totally killed my ser service. And they were like, hey, at least we did it during business hours, unlike Amazon, who might randomly kill your instance on Saturday night. But nowadays, it's not a problem at all. The Chaos Monkey almost never causes a problem because everyone knows that it's coming and so they're just building their systems to not have that failure case. So it's served its purpose well. It's basically made it so that nobody is keeping data on an instance or making it so that one machine is so important that its loss is catastrophic. And so the Chaos Monkey has some uh, older, bigger brothers. Uh, he has the Chaos Gorilla. The purpose of the Chaos Gorilla is to destroy entire Amazon zones, essentially entire data centers. So we wanted to make sure that we could withstand the failure of an entire Amazon zone. It happens uh, when there's a hurricane in Virginia, in particular, is when it happens. Uh, but it'll happen in other cases, too. So we wanted to make sure that we were resilient to that sort of failure. And it was great, because what it helped us find uh, was it helped us find errors with imbalanced requests. Uh, it helps find missing fallbacks, so when suddenly something isn't available, and it's great for stressing our, uh, our persistent data systems as well, uh, because uh, you want to make sure that your persistent data system can handle a failure of one third of your nodes, which it can. Uh, Netflix is using Cassandra. I'll explain a little bit more about why that's awesome later. But essentially, uh, the, the permanent data system, uh, persistent data system, can handle losing a third of the nodes and keep running with no issues. 
Uh, and then there's the Chaos Kong. So uh, I don't know how many of you have been using EC2 for long en uh, enough, but a few years ago on Christmas Day, uh, EC2 in Virginia went down, the load balancers went down for most of the day. Uh, for Netflix, this is really bad. Christmas Day is one of the busiest days of the year for Netflix. People get their brand new toys, and the first thing they want to do is go watch a movie, and they can't, and they're pissed off. And so that motivated us to make sure that our system was multi-region. At that point, it was just in US East. Uh, and so we started making a strong effort towards going to a multi-region system so that we could fail over from one to the other in case that ever happened again. As a nice side effect, that, that work made it so that Europe would operate independently, uh, which it already was, but it made it much better at that, so that when there was a problem in the US, Europeans could continue to watch Netflix unhindered. So the purpose of the Chaos Kong is to essentially make sure that we can do these regional failovers. Uh, it doesn't actually destroy any instances yet, because we're not, not but quite to that point yet, but uh, it does stop all traffic to that region. And it's, uh, you know, right before I left Netflix, we were doing these things every couple of weeks, and customers were not really noticing at all. The other really important monkey is the latency monkey. And uh, earlier, you heard a little bit about network, uh, you know, simulating network partitions uh, during your database, you know, to test your databases. Uh, this is essentially what this does. It, detecting that a service is down is actually a lot easier to do than detecting whether it's slow. In part because what is slow, right? Slow is, vari is variable. It depends on the service. It depends on the needs of both the caller and the source. So detecting slow is very hard to do. And so, you know, we built this, this tool that would essentially induce random latencies to your requests so that you could see what happens to the system when one service becomes slow. Uh, it can do two different kinds of latency. It can put one entire service slow for everybody, uh, and it can also just identify a particular request path and just make that one slow. So you can say just this device is going to get a slow response. And it's always, a, you know, a testing device, not a customer device just in case you're wondering. Uh, and so it's been very useful in finding problems with slowness, because those are the hardest to find. Another important part of your microservices uh, platform is your security, right? You need to have some good security, which is especially important in these distributed environments. There's a lot of surface area that can be attacked when you have a distributed system like this, and so it's extra important to not only secure your perimeter, but secure your inside too, right? We, I, we call this the soft, juicy center. Once you've gotten through the perimeter and you're inside, you can move anywhere, and you don't want to do that. You want to make sure uh, that your security is functioning not just at a network level, but an application level, right? This application should only be able to talk to these applications on these ports because that's the only thing that's necessary. You want to get to that granularity. So that if someone does break into one of your systems, they can't just go to anywhere else in the system, right? Uh, especially if you're going to be deploying these small microservices where each one may have a different security audit rules around them. So there's a lot of surface area that needs to be protected. You want to make sure that you're application-centric in your security tools. Which leads me to my next uh, warning is don't build your own security tools, right? There's a lot of smart people who know security, and they build great tools. And this is another one of those areas, like load balancers, where you can really fall into a trap, uh, especially if you have a little bit of knowledge about security, because then you're going to be very dangerous. So a warning, uh, if you have a little bit of security knowledge, you're probably more dangerous than none, uh, and let other people build your security tools. So that is my ex uh, what I believe is a proper microservices architecture, the one that will get you a scalable, reliable system. But there is one more part to it, and that's your data platform, right? You need to make sure that you have a strong persistence layer underneath. Uh, you heard earlier today that there is no such thing as a good database anymore, uh, because they all break under various, partitioning, uh, various partitions. So instead of trying to find the perfect database, which you won't, this goes back to the testing, right? You need to test your persistent systems. A lot of folks I talk to, they're like, oh yeah, we test our stateless servers all the time. We can totally withstand a failure of our stateless servers. And then I ask, what about your persistent systems? And they say, oh, well, we don't test those because we know those are going to fail. 
Why? Why do you expect those to fail, right? You should be able to build your persistence systems to not fail too. You should be able to accept uh, you know, that this type of failure is going to happen and account for it ahead of time. So it's really important to uh, test your data systems and to build them in a way that's uh, somewhat reli reliable, right? So uh, for example, in Netflix, and I'll have a diagram on this a little bit, uh, we, you know, we make sure that all the data is kept in three copies across three different data centers. So that one data center can be lost and it's not a problem. Or one node can be lost and it's not a problem. Uh, and so, you know, these kinds of things, if you're building your data systems this way, it'll be good. I have a quick story about a bad data system we built at Reddit. Uh, so we used this tool called MemcacheDB for a little while. It's essentially Memcache with Berkeley DB behind it. It's a great tool and it works well until it doesn't. And then all of a sudden it just kind of falls over and dies. And so we hit that at one point. But because we were using a bad hashing algorithm, we were using a mod of an MD5, which is even worse than mod by itself, uh, we basically had to duplicate all the servers. So now we had 10 servers, each one a cop, you know, pairs of copies, basically. But only half the data was useful on each one because now the hashing algorithm had changed because it was mod. And so you know, each one was essentially half the data was now useless, but we didn't know which half of the data, so we couldn't clean it out. And we knew that this was going to be a totally unscalable solution because eventually we would get to a point where 99% uh, of the data on every node would never be accessed. And there was no way for us to figure out how to make it better. So this was actually what uh, motivated us at Reddit to move to Cassandra, uh, which at the time was like version 0.4 or 0.5. So that was in and of itself probably not the smartest thing to do, to use some, a bleeding edge persistence data store. Uh, luckily, at Reddit, we had a, a backup data store, Postgres. Uh, Postgres is by far my favorite database, so shout out to our talk earlier. Uh, Postgres is rock solid. It is because they have the best code review policies I've ever seen. Uh, that code is the, the, mo the cleanest, most beautiful code you will ever read is Postgres code, in my opinion. And it turns out that Postgres is a great key value store, right? Now they actually have key value support directly. But at the time, you know, at Reddit, we essentially built our own key value store out of Postgres. This was the entirety of the schema that we had. Uh, there was two tables, one of which kept track of things and just a few important denormalized pieces of data around them. Uh, and then the rest was just a huge table with a massive index. And so you would just look up, you know, when you wanted all the data on a thing, you would go to the other, find the thing in the thing table, and then you would find the data about it in the data table, and you would pull it back, and you'd have a key value store. And this worked really well. Like, actually, in some cases, a lot better than Cassandra did. Uh, one of Cassandra's big problems is that if, you're not, if you don't need at least five nodes, then it's too much horsepower. You do, you're going to have more overhead running that system than using it. So one of the nice things is that we didn't even need five nodes for almost all the databases. It was only comments that needed more than, one, more than five nodes, basically, at the time. But Cassandra does have its advantages, right? So this is the Netflix global Cassandra architecture. Uh, essentially, it's in, each in each region, there's three copies, one in each zone. And then the data can be you know, moved throughout the world. So when there's a write, say, in US East, uh, that chunk of data will then go and be replicated automatically to all the other clusters around the world. The nice side effect of this, besides the redundancy, is the fact that uh, a user is essentially the same throughout all of the world. So the Netflix account is good no matter where in the world you are, and that data is always being updated around the world. The other nice side effect is that if you have a client in Europe, they can ask questions to their local database. So this distributed database uh, is you know, nice in that it gives a lot of uh, locality, which if you recall, I said that the biggest expense you're gonna have is moving data around your system, so locality is a big solution to that problem. The more local your data is, the better off the health of your entire system is going to be. You have to deal with less network partitions, less network traffic, less network internet weather problems, and you know, everything is just better because it's closer, less hops, etc. So even when one of the regions is partitioned from the rest, it doesn't matter because you're just talking to your own region. Even as a, a nice extra part to that is when that partition exists, a piece of data is written into the east, 
and it gets replicated around the world and then stored for replication to when that partition disappears. So distributed database, key value store, has a lot of uh, importance to running a reliable, scalable system, but it can totally be done with SQL systems as well. And actually, I'm really excited about the stuff we heard about Postgres today, especially the stuff that's coming in the next couple of years, because I think what it'll do is actually allow a lot of the things that have been moved to key value store and schemaless to go back to being things with schema. Because schemaless is great for reliability, but it's not as good for ad hoc queries, for example. You kind of have to know what you're uh, going to ask ahead of time to make a good key value store. And so I liked the, the uh, ad hoc queriesness of a uh, relational database. So I'm really excited to be able to go back to that. So let's go back to what I talked about, right? This illusion of choice. So obviously, I don't actually believe that there's one solution to everything. That was just to get you riled up. <clears throat> but what I do believe is that you do need to ask the right questions, right? You shouldn't just jump into a technology because somebody said, this is the new way to do it, and this is the best way to do it now. Uh, because it's not always the best way. And yes, it might be boring to be implementing old tools and things that have existed, but if you want to build a stable, reliable system, building on old tools where other people have found the edge cases for you is a great way to build a stable, reliable system. And so hopefully that takeaway, to the course of this day, you've learned about a whole bunch of new stuff. And some of it, it may actually be the best solution for you, and some of it may not. So I just want to encourage you to really sit and think about you know, what, uh, what is it that you are trying to accomplish. Does it make sense to go and build a new thing, or does it make sense to get buy one off the shelf, which of course includes the free open source. And so with that, uh, here's how you can get in touch with me if you have any further questions or I'll be hanging around. And I think uh, there's a QA that Sylvan is supposed to be asking me now. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>